Good evening, everyone. I'm Tony Segreto, and once again, honored to be your moderator for tonight's In the Know Town Hall. We welcome all of you. Tonight, we're discussing a topic of utmost importance, type 1 diabetes, an autoimmune disorder that affects millions of people around the globe. Today, the number of people with type 1 diabetes is higher than it's ever been, and the rate of new cases continues to grow faster than we've ever seen it. Type 1 diabetes, once known as juvenile diabetes or insulin-dependent diabetes, is an extraordinarily complex condition. The pancreas makes little or no insulin, so the body has trouble regulating its blood glucose or blood sugar levels. Even after decades of research, type 1 diabetes still has no cure. And for the millions of patients living with it, daily challenges of managing this chronic disease, a cure just can't come fast enough. Thankfully, and I mean thankfully, the Diabetes Research Institute, or DRI, at the Miller School of Medicine leads the world in cure-focused diabetes research. Its researchers are laser-focused on the development of a biological cure for this chronic condition, just as they have pioneered many of the techniques used right now around the world to fight diabetes. They are continually advancing innovations that are bringing new hope to patients. Tonight, we're gonna to hear from some of the most renowned experts at DRI. They are led by Dr. Matthias von Herath, an internationally recognized immunologist and the new scientific director at DRI. He's also the Stacy Joy Goodman Endowed Chair in Diabetes Research. He'll be joined by Dr. Ernesto Bernal Mizrahi. He is the deputy director of beta cell biology and signal transduction at DRI. He's also the chief of the division of endocrinology, diabetes, and metabolism, and professor of internal medicine at the Miller School. And Dr. Rodolfo Galindo. He is the director of the Comprehensive Diabetes Center at UHealth, associate professor of medicine at the Miller School, and director of diabetes management at Jackson Health System. As you can see, this is truly a world-class group of experts supported by the extraordinary philanthropic efforts of the Diabetes Research Institute Foundation. None of this, and I truly mean none of this would happen without their vision and of course their generosity. Now in just a moment, our panelists will begin answering all the questions that you've submitted over the last few days, and there are many of them. You're also gonna have the opportunity to submit some questions tonight during this program live. For those of you who've been with us before, you know the drill, for those of you who are new, Really simple. At the bottom of your screen, you see a Q&A feature. That's what you use to send us your questions. Those questions, we should tell you, all of those submitted will be anonymous, and we promise we're going to get to them, as many of them as we possibly can. But in order to get this ball rolling, we have to start and introduce Dr. Matthias von Herath with some opening, opening marks. Such a pleasure to meet you, sir, and so great to have you with us. Thank you, Tony, and I'm super happy to be here, and thank you for the nice introduction. Also, the introduction to type 1 diabetes, indeed a difficult problem, but with a lot of hope at this point from our side and that we are getting closer to find a solution, prevention, or cure for it. I'm, I'm particularly proud to be here on behalf uh, and represent the Diabetes Research Institute, all the researchers, the physicians, the healthcare workers, that provide eminent care for our patients. And I'm here with great excitement uh, to answer your question, to give you information on type 1 diabetes, and also hope uh, that we are doing our utmost to get closer to find the prevention or cure for this disease. And as some of you know, I, I uh, have done diabetes research for probably 25, 30 years. It sounds pretty long. And it has been the passion of my life, really. And I never thought I, I would move. Um, but then the opportunity at the DRI came along. And uh, now that I'm there for, for two months, it's, it's, it's even better than in my wildest dreams. And it's because not only the, the research is, is so good there, but it also closes the gaps across boundaries to bring important pieces together that are needed for us to find a cure and we will we will talk a little bit more uh, about this today and i think we're getting close as i said before um and i think it is also important to mention uh, that the dri the diabetes research institute uh, would not be there without the generous support of the diif 
Uh, it was born, the DIF was born out of patients uh, who wanted to find a cure for these diseases and has grown uh, into one of the most far reaching and biggest philanthropic organizations. And without them, we really couldn't do it. Uh, having translational research is difficult. Uh, you need to do basic research. You need to bridge gaps in grant funding and so forth. And it's uh, because of that really a fantastic and unique place. So we are super happy to be here. We're gonna make this um, a fun interactive hour with lots of questions answered. Um, and um, I give it back to you, Tony and uh, let's have fun in the next hour or so and be very informative. Well, here we go, doctor. It's so great to have you here. We're gonna keep you right here, Dr. Von Harath, because the first question is for you and it's the million dollar question. It's the no, question everybody asks. How can diabetes be cured and are we close to a cure? So um, this is of course for, for most patients the uh, most central question and I can, give you an analogy that transmits excitement about this. And the analogy is how humankind has to come to fly an airplane. And what is the analogy is that many different things from different directions have to come together before you can fly an airplane. And these build up and build up and build up and then boom, at some point you get close enough and then you're really ready to take off in a good way. And where we are, uh, with finding a cure and why I'm so excited uh, about this uh, with type 1 diabetes is that there is now a proof of concept uh, that in principle you can make new islets that are making the insulin and other hormones in the pancreas from stem cells and you can have these stem cell derived islets and uh, bring them into patients uh, the company uh, Vertex has recently shown this so from this angle we are coming close what else do we need to achieve? And I told you there is many pieces that need to come together. We need to keep the islets long enough alive. We need to protect them from the immune system and we need to protect them in a way that it's tolerable for the patient so that the immune system is not taking too far back. So this multifactoriality uh, makes on the one hand side for excitement, but it also makes uh, for the fact that predicting when precisely the breakthrough is there and when we are ready to fly is not in high, entirely, um, you cannot name it as a year or a, a, a date, but we are, I have the feeling we're getting close. That's why I'm so excited. That's why um, the DRI is in such a good spot to bring all of these different aspects together. So that, I know it was a bit of an evasive answer, but it's also excitement. So uh, there you go. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, doctor. Uh, you know, it's as good as we can get right now. and We'll take anything we can get. Dr. Mizrahi, we welcome you. The next question is for you. What are the different types of diabetes and could you please define them? Thank you, Tony. I think that this is an excellent opening question. Uh, the American Diabetes Association uh, divides diabetes in four types. And, and I guess you can ask yourself why we need to do that. And I think it's important because that also will determine what kind of therapy are we going to use for the patients. So in type 1 diabetes, as, as Matthias already mentioned, is there is an autoimmune destruction of the insulin producing cells. And how can I just explain this more carefully is that your own immune system uh, attack your insulin producing cells and destroys them. Traditionally, this was uh, uh, initially thought that was uh, juvenile uh, diabetes and it was uh, diagnosed in, in uh, children and in uh, young kids, but we now know that, uh, uh, you know, adults and older people can develop type 1 diabetes. And type 2 diabetes, uh, which the main hallmark of type uh, to diabetes is insulin resistance. And what happened here is that your body becomes more resistant to your own insulin and those insulin producing cells have to work harder and harder, but they already have a defect that you are born with and they cannot really overcome that insulin resistance. So uh, with that, then is when type two diabetes develops. The third one, which is also common is gestational diabetes. And this is diabetes that is diagnosed during pregnancy. And for people to know pregnancy is the uh, 
natural state of insulin resistance. So let's say that people uncover a, a, a defect that they were born and many of the uh, patients that are diagnosed with diabetes in pregnancy develop later diabetes in life. Let's say about you know a half or, or a third. And then the last one are other type of diabetes, genetic diseases, and also diseases of the uh, pancreas that can also cause diabetes as well as medication. So I think that uh, with that, I close, but I think the most important point is that we are still learning that there are more subtypes of diabetes and that we th that is important that we know what type of diabetes the patients have because that will really help us to for the treatment. Dr. Mizrahi, thank you. Dr. Galindo, welcome. We're happy to have you with us tonight. What are the most innovative medications and insulin available today? Thank you so much, Tony, for the invitation. I'm very honored to be here with these two great scientists. I wouldn't call myself a scientist. I'm a clinician. I see patients and I try to find better ways to treat them when I see them in the clinic. So I do research, but I'm not these great scientists here. So so um, I, I feel that we have advanced a lot in the field. So when I went into my specialty about 10 years ago, it was not, not as we see it today. So for type one, while we find the solution, uh, the, 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 the solution that Dr. Von Herat and Dr. Mirashi were discussing, there have been a lot of development, developments in the pharmacotherapy. So we all know that insulin, insulin is the main therapy for type 1 diabetes. I would say the only therapy for type 1 diabetes. And we can discuss among ourselves 20 hours on this. But, but the way we administer insulin and the way the insulin works is what we're, where we have advanced tremendously. So there are different type of insulins nowadays that try to mimic the way the human insulin, the, the insulin that the body makes will work. In that sense, we produce much better, much better, um, we have much better therapies. But if there is something that we have really, really advanced, is on the way we monitor glucose, the way we monitor sugar. And if you read about this, about 100 years ago, we used to measure uh, sugar in the urine by colors. You know, it was a nice experiment, but it was developed in England and it was the only way for 50 years. But for the last 50 years, we have advanced and advanced. And nowadays is, is, is standard of care. Standard of care is what is considered the best therapy that all physicians in the country should be doing is a continuous glucose monitoring. What is that? It's a little device. It's minimally invasive because it has a small plastic cannula that is inserted in the subcutaneous tissue, the superficial tissues of the arm or the belly, and is monitoring the glucose every five minutes. And that is terrific for patients because they can see where the sugars or glucose go, goes after different things in life, after eating, after exercising, after being stressed, after drinking coffee with or without sugar, after drinking, um, uh, I don't know, a Splenda May desserts versus a regular sugar dessert. So, so it really makes a big difference to people. But also because we went away from the finger sticks. So for years, our patients have been pricking their fingers to obtain a blood, a drop of blood to put it in the glucose meter. It's, we're using the same technique, but in a sensor that does not need that finger stick all the time. And, and what I really see a tremendous advantage is that those glucoses that we measure every five minutes are seen in a smart cell phone or device by the patient or their family members or even physicians 24-7. So that actually provides a 24 hours comprehensive glucose assessment uh, that we had not seen before. And then the latest that we have seen is integrating these fascinating CGM continuous glucose monitoring with different way of delivering insulin, whether it's by injections or not, or whether it's by pumps or not, or whether the pump can communicate with the sensor and the sensor with the pump through a smart system that is on the cloud and it make adjustment on the amount of insulin. That is where really we have advanced tremendously. So, so, so this is not anymore pricking fingers and shooting insulin as it was 50 years ago. I'm very excited about it. Thank you, doctor. That's, that's amazing how far we've come and, and really in such a short period of time. Dr. Harath, we just had this sent in. We thought it was important to get it to you now. What causes the late onset of type 1 diabetes? And could it have been missed 
when I was younger. So there's different views uh, on whether diabetes, especially type one, is a continuous spectrum that just varies in intensity or whether they are different forms of the disease. My personal experience and uh, opinion is after studying uh, the human pathology of this disease for probably 15 years, thanks to the National Pancreatic Organ Donor Consortium or NPOT, that we are dealing with a continuum. So what happens in young kids is in essence a very similar or the same process as if you get type 1 diabetes at later age. It's just in intensity much milder. And it shouldn't surprise us to see this type of spectrum in an autoimmune disease because you have aggressive and mild forms of MS, multiple sclerosis. You have the same in arthritis. So I, I think that's the spectrum we see. Where it becomes a little bit more problematic and where I think all of us have to be more vigilant, there was a divisiveness introduced into the field early on that young people who get diabetes have type 1 and old people who have diabetes have type 2 diabetes that's more related to being overweight or insulin resistant. I don't think we, we can look at it this way anymore. We should look at it that there is an immune reaction to islets and type 1 diabetes that is stronger in young people and then mild and older, but it's still type 1 diabetes. Then in addition to this, also in type 1 diabetes, you can have problems with obesity and you can also accelerate the pressure on your beta cells uh, by being obese or by becoming insulin resistant. That's also when you, for example, have infections or like uh, uh, Bernal was saying do, during pregnancy. So that's, uh, that's how I look at it. And it gives us more possibilities to treat the disease. First of all, if it's the same process, we can attune similar medicine. Second of all, if we can do something about obesity and uh, we have uh, with Rodolfo and Banel much better experts here on the panel for that. We can also help in type 1 the beta cells because it turns out that a, a hard working sweaty beta cell, so to speak, that's trying to put up all its last insulin also sticks out like a red beacon to the immune system in a way and it's easier to recognize. So we can work at the problem from different angles. But the short answer is uh, late onset diabetes in adults I might have other features because you might be overweight, have other features or insulin resistance. But the reaction in the islets from what we have studied seems very similar, immune, uh, logically speaking. Dr. Galindo, I saw you shaking your head. Would you like to, to add on to that? <laughs> now we get into it. Well, <laughs> no, so this is great because we're getting more comfortable. And then at some point, I'm going to apologize if I call... Matias or Ernesto, we work together every day, so it's hard for me to call them by the last name. So apologies if that happened. So we doctors don't like to make diseases complex. Diseases are complex itself. We do not like to have type one diabetes mixed with type two or type two or something like that. We don't like that, but that's how nature makes things. So type one diabetes is no longer only diagnosed in young kids. We also have older adults, but then we also have young, young people being diagnosed with type 2 diabetes because of these so-called excess adiposity, a term that I prefer. So, so, so when we accumulate excess adipose tissue, fat cells, and we put them in the wrong places and they work wrong, we get an, another disease, right? So like type 2 diabetes and insulin resistance. Nowadays, many of our patients with type 1 diabetes would also have a component of this excess adiposity and insulin resistant. And that's when the whole mix. And then Ernesto, apologies, Dr. Mirashi, <laughs> Ernesto is an expert in these correlationships, so he, he probably can give a better explanation. No, I think this is a, is a great uh, analogy. And, and the, the key issue for people is to know that uh, at least in my clinic, I see that frequently is that if you see an older individual who is lean that is requiring insulin, you always need to think to test for type one diabetes, and and that's one of the uh, one of the phenot or the how patients can present in in later autoimmune onset diabetes. So people who are lean 
that are requiring insulin is important to test for type 1 diabetes. Dr. Mizrahi, thank you. And we're going to keep you here because this was just sent in and we sort of touched on this with, with, with you earlier. And the question goes like this, how does type 1 diabetes affect a woman during pregnancy and what are the biggest risks? So this is a, an interesting and, and a very physiological question. So what happened in pregnancy in, in patients who have diabetes is that there is increasing glucose and that increase in glucose can have major effects, not only in organogenesis of, of the baby, I was, in other words, formation of the organs in the baby, but also what happened is that that glucose is also transferred to the baby and that baby, the response to the baby is produce insulin because you still see a lot of uh, glucose around. And that increase in insulin, what it does as a growth factor that insulin can be, induces you know, fat deposition. And that's why it's frequently that uh, the babies from mothers who have diabetes are overweight when they're born. And there's also associated with complications during uh, parturition. And, and, and I, all those factors are important in, in uh, considering how diabetes can affect, uh, you know, a baby during pregnancy. And thank you, Dr. Mizrahi. Dr. Galindo, this was just sent in to us. Uh, is hair thinning a common symptom or outcome of insulin resistance or just general type 1 diabetes that you often see? So, so is, is medicine, again, so we don't like to make things complex, but nothing in medicine is one thing equals the other one. So diseases are a complex of many symptoms. So it's very hard to say, if I lose my hair, there's only one disease. There are many diseases that have that. In fact, losing hair is not a typical symptom for diabetes per se. I mean, I expect they're referring to a scalp, a scalp hair, but, but uh, it's not a typical symptom of type one diabetes at all. So, so, but again, in medicine, we try to say never is never because it's always something else, but I would not be concerned for type one diabetes by losing hair. I would be concerned by other symptoms, right? So losing weight, feeling thirsty, uh, urinating frequently, having a family history of that or something like that. Uh, uh, we have experts in, in finding out who has the better risk, the, the higher risk of developing type one diabetes in the, uh, uh, here in the panel today, but, but hair, hair, losing hair is not in the least. Thank you, Dr. Galinda. Uh, Dr. Ron Haroth, how close is a pancreatic transplant or stem cell options? Yeah, so that uh, is really, when you think about it, the cure for, for diabetes. Because once the islet cells or the beta cells producing insulin have been attacked by the immune system and lost, they're gone. And they don't grow back. There are some other diseases where the organ can regenerate super well. We have, we have recently learned that the beta cells can do this a bit too, but, but not fast enough to, to outpace their destruction. So the general notion is uh, you have to put new ones back in. And ideally, uh, we think that if we had stem, a stem cell source, an unlimited source, and that was the excitement I was referring to at the beginning, and then we can make new little islets with all the needed cells, not only beta cells, so they can talk to each other and put these back into patients. Now, the things that need to be happening for this to become mainstream, coming back to flying the airplane, like to commercial air travel, let's say, and not a singular event of somebody staying in the air uh, long enough, we need to have enough of those. We, we need to find a way to keep the immune system from not recognizing them either locally where they get transplanted or by making them invisible with like a Harry Potter cloak, so to speak, around the, the new islets or by keeping the immune system at day or all the three of them. We need to give them enough nutrients. We need to find that's the right site to put them. Usually in the pancreas, normally where they sit, they have a lot of vessels. So they can get lots of nutrients and then the insulin can get out immediately because they're like mini factories, they're busy cells. So they need a good blood supply. So once we solve all these, 
um, I think we will have stem cell replacement as a cure for, for diabetes. And I said in the beginning, that we can see now the single components that we need with much, with much more clarity than let's say 10 or 20 years ago. So, so that's where we stand. It's an exciting time. Yeah, it sounds so As you exciting. will note, I, I dodged the question again to put a precise year on this. <laughs> but, <laughs> Thank you, doctor. Uh, doctor Mizrahi, why is glucose control so important in diabetes? So this is actually one of the uh, major topics in diabetes, and I guess uh, Dr. Galindo Rolf already is, you know spent some time explaining why the delivery of insulin has made such a big difference in in diabetes. So in terms of the how glucose is important in the short term, we already uh, mentioned that uh, people can get increase in urination, thirsty, weight loss. And some other uh, uh, symptoms. So, so that's in the short term. In the long term, high glucose can damage organs, especially the eyes, the kidney, and the nerves and the vascular system. And that's what we call the eye retinopathy, in the kidney nephropathy, in the in the nerves neuropathy, and then cardiovascular di uh, uh, diseases are uh, you know like having coronary artery disease or heart attacks, which are frequent. The important point about this is that by controlling glucose, we can prevent these complications. And that's why having a, a good control with different um, pharmacological agents is so critical to prevent the complications, which is an increased cost of mortality in, in diabetes. And, and if, if, if I may, may add, and, and that's precisely uh, the reason that we are trying to work on a prevention or cure, because as you can Im imagine, Tony, uh, tr trying to control your glucose after every meal and counting car carbohydrates and staying on top of this, 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 this is um, quite, let's say, an exercise for all the patients. Every patient will tell you they want a vacation from this disease. And we are really working very, very passionately to initially at least give a temporary vacation or a delay of the disease like it has recently been achieved by the, the anti-CD3 from Prevention Bio, and then hopefully eventually a permanent vacation from the disease um, and the need to, to stay on top of this every meal and every day and all the time, avoiding that you go too high, avoiding that you go too low with the sugar and so forth. How great would that be? Uh, I'm going to put this out to the panel because we just had this uh, sent in. What are the chances the child of a type 1 diabetes woman also will have type 1 diabetes? And is there anything that can be done to delay the onset to the child? Yeah, I can start on this and, and uh, others will have opinions on that. Um, so genetically transferred diabetes plays a role, but most most of the diabetes we see nowadays is actually not a diabetes that is transmitted through genes in the family. But they are what you call susceptibility genes, several of them that influence the immune system and other factors that render you more likely to get diabetes. And there are many families where uh, the genes are in the parents and then get transmitted to the kids. Now you can measure the risk getting diabetes by measuring antibodies to the beta cells. This is something we can do. And these antibodies define the risk pretty well, the more you have. And based on this, you can recommend to patients whether there should be an intervention. And just since uh, this year we have now, what I mentioned this anti-CD3, the biological therapy, that is at least an option. Uh, that has been shown to delay the onset of diabetes on average by two, maybe three years in patients. So it's what I would call a foot in the door. It's not a permanent abolishment of the disease, but it shows us that progress can be made. And likewise, not only in delaying the actual disease, but also probably in a similar way, in a tolerable way for patients after they would, uh, hopefully after they would receive a stem cell derived islet transplantation. So that's where the field is on that. 
Dr. Galindo, would you like to weigh in on this? So, yeah, so we're definitely making progress in many uh, fields. So the wonder cure would be to uh, prevent the disease from happening. And Matthias is working on that and Dr. Mirashi uh, and the whole team at the DRI and the division. But, but we have to work a little bit more. So the next step is to work on delaying the onset of the disease when you already have some predisposition. And there is something already commercially available for that. It's not the wonder uh, medication, but at least it's the first step. And first steps are always expensive and difficult, and we learn from that. But at least we have the first step. But then if you progress and you develop the disease, then the treatment is insulin. Uh, and then there we have made a lot of progress as well. So back in the days was you know, I don't know, the first day that somebody received insulin about a hundred and three years ago, is that right? A hundred or two years ago, that was a humongous amount of insulin that was not good. Nowadays it's a very tiny mini dose of insulin delivered by an specialized insulin pump that talks to a continued glucose monitoring and has some adjustment on the dose based on how the sugar goes up and down. So it's a whole bioengineering system that uses a continuous glucose monitoring and an insulin pump. So we have different stages, and I think that in many ways we're working. We're working on prevention, we're working on delaying, we're working on treating the disease so you don't get the complications. So I'm very optimistic, and, and I have family members with type 1 diabetes, and we all talk in the family, this is not what it used to be. Dr. Mizrahi? I think that, I mean, they have given probably a very complete answer. But to me, what I want to add is that participation in research is key for us to be able to develop the new therapies. So if you have somebody with type 1 diabetes being tested, it's important because you can then have options for clinical trials. And, and that's what is going to drive the, the, you know, the advance. Thank you, doctor. And we're going to open this again to the panel because this was just sent in and we are getting so many questions. By the way, thank you for all of your questions. Keep them coming. We're going to get to as many of them as we possibly can. So here we go. Is there any more information regarding the potential identification of another subtype of type 1 diabetes that occurs in those over 12 years of age? Some speculation that this might be easier to reverse or cure. Who would like to start this off? Dr. Matias, we'll start you, we'll, we'll go with you again. I, I have strong opinions about this. Uh, as I indicated before, I don't think there's different uh, subtypes uh, necessarily. There's mixture of problems you can have, an immune problem, an insulin resistant problem related to an obesity problem, and you can have vascular inflammations that render you more susceptible to cardiovascular disease. But the, the actual uh, attack on the beta cells in type 1 diabetes is a continuum. But given the fact, if you get this later, by definition, uh, it is not quite usually as an aggressive disease as if you get it with two years of age. So in other words, you would think that there is some hope that you can tackle uh, this disease a little bit easier uh, if you get it later in life, but we need to see that. We, we ran um, uh, together with uh, Novo Nordisk, a large trial that was published in the journal Lancet Endocrinology and showed in a large adult trial that you can still preserve beta cells in adults. I don't think it's a, it's a different disease though. I think it's a continuum altogether. But uh, Rodolfo and Bernal, you might have different opinions. A good discussion. <laughs> Dr. <Ms. Ryan. laughs> it's always good. <laughs> no, I think that that's, that's a good question. I think that probably what the caller is referring, because you know there, there was a lot of hype on this, is neonatal diabetes. What happened is that those patients might be diagnosed later in life, and then by using some medications, they can revert to be insulin independent. But the the disease probably, I mean, it was a, a genetic disease that the, the patients were born with. And this is more 
mutations in some of the uh, channels that regulate insulin secretion in the beta cell. And what happened is that those channels respond to some of the medications that are used to for type 2 diabetes, like sulfonylurea, glimepiride, glibiride, and all those. And what happened is that after that discovery was made, again, by research, uh, some of these patients by treated with pills, they were completely, you know, cured from what initially was called type 1 diabetes. So that might be what the color is referring to. So. Dr. Galindo. So, so Tony, yeah, so I, I, I love the, the question because, again, it's not that we want to make things complex. This is the nature of medicine. And that's why it's good to see an expert in diabetes or what we call a diabetologist. So it's not type one in young kids. It's, it's, it's a different type of diabetes in young kids. It's not type two in the elderly. There are different type of diseases in the elderly. So that's why it's all, always good to see an expert that think behind and outside the box. Is this just pure type one? Is this a congenital diabetes? Is this a combination of type one who has excess adiposity and needs something else? So, so experts think outside the box and go beyond this mirror classification on one, two, three others. So, so, so I'm a member of the guidelines and we need to come up with these one, two, and three lines. But reality is that when we discuss this in the committees, patients are never a guideline patient. You know, patients are complex and they have different presentations. So it's always good to see an expert that put the puzzle together and make the whole medicine work. Medicine is, an, is, a, is, a, is the art of the science. It's an art that we physicians put together, right? So, but what a beautiful way to put it. It's the art of the science. I, I have to remember that. That's a, a beautiful way to put it, Dr. Glendo. I guess if, if I want to add a, a little bit more to what yes, uh, please. you also mentioned. So, so, I mean, when you define diabetes, what is diabetes? It's increasing glucose in the blood, right? And there are many abnormalities that can be. Can, that can cause that. Even in type 2 diabetes, we know that there are different subtypes of type 2 diabetes with different characteristics. And the next step is what is going to happen is that we're going to have personalized medicine. But to get there, we need to define what are the different types of diabetes so we can have a personalized medicine approach for the, the management of diabetes. So. Great. Dr. Mizrahi, we're going to keep you here. Uh, are any, and anyone can weigh in on this one too, because this was just sent in, but are any of the cures thought to not require an immunosuppressant following? For type one, I, I think, you know, if you, if you, we go back to what we have been discussing for the last half an hour, the, there are two components on type one diabetes. One is the immune system attacking the uh, insulin producing cells and the other one is the insulin producing cells defending or being more resistant to that. So if you treat only the uh, the beta cells, you still will have the autoimmune destruction of the beta cells. So you, I would say it's maybe an incomplete strategy. I think that the best strategy is to be able to act on the two components of type type one diabetes, one, the immune system, and the other one is the beta cell or the insulin producing cells. And that's why the new generation of uh, trials in type one diabetes use multiple medications, some that will act on the immune system and some that will act on the uh, insulin producing cell. I, I fully agree with this, Bernal. And um, I think we can even, and it's an intensive area we are working on at, uh, at, at the DRI, improve immune therapies in the sense that the burden, uh, that was, I think, the way, way I understood the question, that the burden from immunosuppressing becomes less by giving an induction therapy that's short in dura duration and sort of resets some things. And then you only need a maintenance therapy. And the maintenance therapy can be something that takes care of the beta cell not being so visible to the immune system, or it can even be uh, and many groups are working on this, something that re-educates the immune system specifically to make, so to speak, a peacekeeper troops that recognize beta cells. And then when they recognize them, keep peace locally in the pancreas and in, in its environment, sort of your own, they're called regulatory cells, but your own peacekeeper troops that can be educated without impacting your overall immune reactivity systemically. So, 
So there's a lot of a lot of uh, progress in that. And the therapies will, rather than being a blunt hammer, become much more specific and much better tolerable. That's what I think is a big part of that sweet spot, speed spot finding to, to really make things take off. Yeah, it's incredible the progress that, that that's been made in this area. And uh, you know, Dr. Galindo, you know, I'm kind of we got this question sent in, but it's kind of based off of what. Uh, Dr. Von Harath said earlier how people want to take a vacation uh, from this disease. So the question goes like this, do you provide therapies for the resulting depression that comes from long-term diabetes and the constant battle to manage the condition? And Dr. Marahi, we'll get to, get to you in a second because obviously there are a lot of people want to weigh in on this, but Dr. Galindo, why don't you kick this off? Yeah, so, so again, the main focus of the treatment of type 1 diabetes is to try to correct that excess sugar in the blood into what is considered normal level, right? But that's not the only option. That's not the only choice. That's not the only treatment. This is a complex multifactorial with many phases disease that you need to treat in a comprehensive manner. So uh, it's not just a diabetes physician. It's, it's also a diabetes educator, it's also a psychotherapist, it's also uh, uh, um, a different specialty. So yes, yeah, so we do provide those services. Um, it's hard when, when we're thinking about children, right? But, but um, luckily our children are always happy and, and we just need to make an environment that is better for them. But as disease pro progresses, I understand the burden. We have patients in the DRI that have been our patient for 30 and 40 years. And yes, it's a burden of disease, and we do take that in consideration, and we provide that service. Um, the person that, that sent that question has gone through through this in their family or something, and and understands what we deal with. Sometimes we try to do the so-called medicine. Oh, how are you doing? How are your medications? And we need to stop and do the art of the medical science and learn what is happening. That is not just prescribing medications. So sometimes if we don't pay attention to your A1C or your injections, and we stop and switch and try to get something else is because we're sensing that maybe the need today is not your A1C. The need today is to understand how you're feeling. And, and that's what we do in the, in the center. You know? Thank you, Dr. Glenn. Dr. Mizrahi, I know you wanted to uh, kind of add to this. No, I think that I, I really feel for that question because we see a lot of patients and, and like that, uh, we can, not underestimate the impact that mental health has on diabetes and that diabetes has on mental health. So uh, it's, it's a challenge that we face every day. And the, the irony of that is that mental health uh, management has become such a difficult issue in you know these days where finding really therapists is very difficult. And not only that, if any therapies that are covered by insurance is even more difficult. So, so I think that this is this is an essential component of uh, diabetes care that is sometimes underestimated. Yeah, thank you, Doctor. Uh, Doctor Mizrahi, uh, this was just sent in. Excuse me, Doctor uh, Doctor Matias, this was just sent in. Is there a specific test to confirm the diagnosis of type one diabetes for adults and children? So it doesn't it doesn't vary between adults and children, but we we mentioned before that we can measure these antibodies, and antibodies are sort of the signature of the immune system's attack on the beta cells, and that can be reliably measured at this point, and is used to diagnose type one diabetes, and depending on how many of different of these antibodies you have, you can also see whether your risk is higher or lower. This correlates pretty well. And, um, and that's, that's actually very important for us to get closer to having a prevention for type one diabetes because uh, we need to find everybody who, who is at risk to develop the disease. The, the global golden vision is, and we've been working on that, that it would at some point be uh, included as a routine screening at certain times during childhood. And then you, of course, you need to build the infrastructure. If you have positive results, you have to uh, prepare the, the patient for uh, what it means 
for the journey. And uh, we are just starting, as we discussed before, to then also being able to offer certain treatments that can delay the onset of clinical diagnosis of diabetes. Thank you, doctor. Uh, and this goes out to the panel, another one sent in. Any insight on progress and availability of a bar by hormonal, by hormonal insulin pumps before a cure is found? Dr. Mizrahi, you're, why don't you start? Yes, us? It, this, this is going to be Dr. about nothing. <laughs> no, I think that the, Dr. Galindo probably has a lot. I mean, I'm going to start sure. saying that, yeah, the dual uh, pumps are, you know, uh, a reality. I think that the the fact of using two hormones, which is one is glucagon, the other one is insulin. So the the use of these two hormones balance the, the glucose. So insulin drops the glucose, glucagon increases the glucose. So the, the pump, what it does is, is try to balance the infusion of the two hormones to maintain a glucose in the steady state level. So I think that they are I mean, there are a lot of progress on this type of therapy, and I probably would let uh, Rodolfo uh, give more information because he's, you know, he's an so expert in technology. So, yeah, the dual the dual hormonal system is fascinating from a scientific standpoint. And I remember the first time I met one of the creators, uh, Ed Damiano. He's not a physician; he's a engineering from um, MIT who committed to develop this because his son has type one diabetes. So. If you ever see him in a meeting or anything, you will not see a person with a suit. You will see somebody with a t-shirt because he's very down to earth. And he's committed to this along with the Harvard diabetologist. So uh, the first time I hear about this, I said, this is a genius, a, you know, amazing idea. But this has been, been going on for about 10 years or more, right? So what happened is finding that tuned balance that the body is able to do that we cannot replicate with medication. So finding the right amount. And then the latest study, so, so the latest work from the dual hormone study, I think the company is called Islet, Islet, right? They needed to do a study with just insulin to get FDA buy-in. Uh, uh, to say that that system works. And then after they do the work that allows the FDA approval of insulin alone, we'll need to do the second study, which is ongoing already. The problem is that the latest study was not that surprising. Why? Because now we have other systems, so-called automated insulin delivery system, closed loop systems, artificial pancreas system, the same thing, that do similar things. And then I use glucagon and they do amazingly terrific well. So nowadays we have about three systems, is that right? Three systems available in the US, UK has another one, that administer insulin from the pump connected to the continuous glucose monitoring and an algorithm that is on the cloud, this amazing place that we have everything that is good and sometimes bad, calculate the right amount of insulin. So if the insulin is going down, and then the sugar is going down, so the pumps start suspending and decreasing the amount of insulin. The sugar is going up, then the insulin is going up. The sugar is uh, dropping, the pump is stopping. So, so we have these amazing systems nowadays that many people wonder if the glucagon is needed. I do believe that is, yes, it's needed. But the work, we, we need to still working on it. I think that is scientifically speaking, amazing. It's replicating the through pancreas, but the work is still there. Well, thank you. I tell you what, I think we'd all like to see what that cloud looks like, wouldn't we? Uh, <laughs> uh, Dr. Matias, uh, this was just sent in as well, and I hate to repeat myself, but they're just keep coming in and coming in. Uh, most, most clinical trials are for adults. What are the options for clinical trials for children under the age of 18, Dr. Matias? So we, we have to, uh, of course, do this in a stepwise fashion, especially if, if we modulate the immune system. And it, re it really also relates to, from a regulatory perspective, how much you do to the immune system and the safety studies that are needed based on this. And um, I think it is wise to, to test many things wherever possible. It's not possible for all the drugs, but wherever possible, first in adults. And then when they are super safe, move them down in a stepwise fashion 
to, to the younger children. But there are several approaches that are now moving into children and you, you can always contact us and uh, we can have a discussion about that. It's an exciting time. The approaches that uh, will go in, in, into younger children, they will uh, often lesser modulate the immune system, but they will uh, try to educate these peacekeeper cells, for example, with antigenic immune therapies and so forth. But uh, I think the, the message to, to have and to leave is that of course there will be therapies that are not only for adults, they will also be for children. Uh, but because of safety, uh, you can say unfortunately, but it's really the way it should be. Uh, it's not going to be the one and two year olds. <laughs> We're going to treat first to try out new drugs. That's that's not how it can be, right? right? So, so I want to say something also on this, uh, Tony. Um, uh, I checked the participants, and we have a couple of our colleagues from pediatric endocrinology at the University of Miami. So in fact, Dr. Janine Sanchez is one of the participants who is the director of the Division of Pediatric Endocrinology. And why I call her now is because we have a very, really good relationship. So we do studies, including children. Uh, as scientists, we would like to have anybody, but of course there are some preventions and there is an uh, IRB uh, uh, institutional review system that check how much we can do, right? So they're protecting our participants in research. But we have a really good relationship with the pediatric department and uh, they, 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 they send patients to our studies. We, we talk to them. So, so uh, if, if any of your children or so your family uh, members are willing to participate or looking for a study, so whether reaching out to us or whether reaching out to the pediatric endocrinology, so we are really good colleagues and um, we cannot do it without them. And, uh, and we are really thankful for the partnership and collaboration. So uh, the question is very appropriate. And I want to uh, appreciate the participation of the pediatric endocrinology also in this uh, meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Glendo. Thank you for letting us know that. Uh, this was sent in and I hope I'm pronouncing this right. I am on Wagovi for diabetes type two, chronic weight, have had great results the past year, but the last six weeks, the medicine stopped working and my hunger has increased significantly. What suggestions do you have? Who would like to weigh in on this first? So I can make a, a quick comment because we're, we're moving away a little bit from type one. So, so semaglutide is a medication that was developed years ago. Uh, I would say about, I've been using semaglutide for about seven years ago. The first name that was given to this uh, wonder medication was Ozempic. And it was when it was approved for type two diabetes. So it's the disease that is related to insulin resistant in persons who have excess adiposity. And then serendipity, these things that we do in life and we don't know what we do, we learned that it was really good for making people lose weight. So it controls appetite in a terrific way that we have not seen this in years. And then people lose weight and they also control the diabetes. So then when we learn this, we move on to the next step was testing this medication for weight loss in people with or without diabetes. And then the name of the same medication, but at a different dose was Wigovi. And this is what we have seen over the last, I would say six to 12 months on the news because it made it to Hollywood. So, so Hollywood people now want to lose weight, whether they need it or not, it's a different discussion. And then I think that these medications are really good and they are changing the way we treat type 2 diabetes. They're actually changing the way we think type 2 diabetes is going to be in the future. We are not talking about uh, remission of type 2, di type 2 diabetes because these medications do a really good work. The best way and the best advice for this good colleague who asked the question is to reach out to our center. We'll try to get you in, try to see you, and give you a specific advices. And then this is not a one-month treatment or disease approach. This is a long-term approach to controlling excess adiposity and controlling diabetes. We all wish this could be done in a month, but the reality is the faster you go, the more likely you're going to fail. So the more progressive and steady you get there, you're more likely going to make it. So don't rush. More medication is not always the answer. And I think that he's losing some weight and making some progress. Congratulations, you're one of those patients that are making it. So I'm thank you for doing the effort too. So 
Thank you, Dr. Galindo. Dr. Mizrahi, yes. No, I just wanted to add a few things. Uh, number one is that I think the majority of the medications that I use for obesity work for some time. And then with time, people tend to regain the weight. That includes even bariatric surgery in some somewhat. I guess from the endocrinology standpoint, it's not unusual that when you use a hormone, because this is a homolog of a hormone of your body, GLP-1, these constant high levels might induce some decrease on, on the receptors. And I'm just speculating because I don't know if there is any data. So I wouldn't be surprised that having a constant high level of a hormone that the body doesn't see, the, 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 the cells will defend from that by decreasing the expression of the receptors to that hormone binding. So that's just a speculation, but it's so, so, and all of, the, all of this is new. So do please understand that we used to treat diseases in a way, we learned that these are really good medication, people lose weight. Uh, the studies were done to get it approved and now we're using it in clinical settings. So we're also learning with you so what I have seen is that if you stop it, it's very unlikely the effects are going to fade away or even disappear. And many people tend to gain their way back unless they make a big lifestyle changes. And we all have this speculation that this long-term treatment may have an effect later on that you will need it no matter what. So, so I also have a similar impression from many of my patients. My advice is to keep doing it. Yeah, <laughs> don't, don't let don't let the disease win the battle. All right, this is not a one thing to get it done tomorrow. Yeah, great way to put it. Don't let the disease win the battle. Uh, Dr. Matias, would you like to weigh in on this? Uh, you're the only one we haven't heard from yet. No, I shouldn't weigh in on this. I have a conflict of interest when it comes to the specific drug, so I won't weigh on in on that. Tony, sorry. <laughs> uh, Tony, I think that a really good point to make here is that we were discussing this the other day uh, for the audience. We have a meeting that we're, we discuss uh, science and it was one hour and we spent like three because we were discussing how many of our patients with type 1 diabetes now they also have excess adiposity. Um, and we, of course, have seen these wonders benefit of these medications. Semaglutide, for example, is one and is the other one on people with type two diabetes. And we were wondering if this is a good choice for type one. And the answer is we all believe it is a solution or not, not a solution, it's an option, mm -hmm. but the studies are still there. And it's right. definitely not the main treatment. So these are treatments for type two diabetes. Mm -hmm. the, the, the main treatment for type one is insulin, right? So different diseases, right? But now we have these mixed type one and type two that we believe some people also will benefit. But again, the answer is these are not approved for that. And these medications are, some people are studying. I don't want to, Ernesto may want to come in and make some. No, no, I just want to make a, a final comment in regards to a previous question about enrolling in clinical trials. The number to call is 305-243-5315. So that's for people who are interested in participating in clinical trial. You want to repeat that one more time sure. if someone is grabbing a it's pencil. 305-243-5321. Thank you, Dr. Mizrahi, uh, Dr. Galindo, Dr. Mati. I don't know where the shower went. I mean, it is. In fact, we've gone over a little bit. Uh, so that is our last question. And I, I know we have a lot that we didn't get to. We'll do our best to, to kind of get you some answers. Uh, but Dr. Matias, we'd like to, some closing comments from you. Yes. Uh, the first comment is, is gratitude for having us here. And hopefully we transmitted uh, to everybody uh, excitement and optimism that we are really uh, working on an important problem and uh, that we are getting closer. And uh, I'm very also grateful for the environment at uh, the DRI and at you Health. Grateful to all my colleagues, uh, especially you two friends, <laughs> of course, uh, our work together and the dedication uh, to, to find, find a cure. Uh, certainly last but not least, it's important to say, um, tackling these difficult problems uh, also, to a large extent, relies on philanthropy. It, that is very important uh, because of 
funding new creative ideas that would not be easily picked up by the mainstream by buffering the peaks and valleys and by reaching certain moonshots that otherwise could fall by the wayside. And because of that, I'm particularly grateful to the Diabetes Research Institute Foundation, without whom many of uh, the things that we're seeing now uh, wouldn't be possible. And um, reach out to us. Um, uh, Bernal already uh, put the number out there. We'd like to hear from you. We are also very interactive in terms of email. And um, thank you so much. Thank you. Dr. Matias, Dr. Mizrahi, Dr. Golindo, and thank all of you for participating in tonight's In the Know Town Hall. We have had a record number of people join us tonight with a record number of questions. And we know many of you either are dealing with type 1 diabetes or know someone close to you who is. And we also know the cure can't come fast enough for any of you or any of us. That's why we truly hope that tonight's event helped answer some of your questions and maybe, just maybe, reduce some of your anxiety. Our doctors, as you heard, are passionate and working nonstop to find the cure that we're all waiting for. And with their boundless energy that I'm sure we all felt tonight, you should all realize how blessed we truly are to have them leading this battle. Please remember that a full recording of this program will be posted online. Look for the link in the coming days. And in a moment, you're going to see a survey about tonight's town hall on your screen. Take a minute. It doesn't even take that long. It takes about 30 seconds to submit your feedback because what that does is help us understand your interest and improve our program. And as always, we wish you and your family nothing but good, good health. And remember, it's all about, you got it, the you. Good night, everybody.